Hello and thanks for joining us. This is part of the tutorial created for students studying in the Ocean and Naval Architectural Engineering Discipline at Memorial University of Newfoundland's Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Today's tutorial is intended to provide an example of a rapid hull modeling process for a displacement hull that uses the basic design curves and the loft command to generate surfaces over the curves. Furthermore, we're also going to look at how this approach might be used to create a more complex hull form such as a bulbous bow, and I'll apply a Boolean difference to create a bow thruster cavity within my hull form. The objective of today's lecture is to amplify your knowledge of methods of hull form creation using CAD software. As designers, we may have to use a variety of techniques to create designs at various stages of the design process. Therefore, it is important to have a variety of drafting tools within your professional toolbox from which to draw on in order to quickly create the designs you're envisioning. For instance, in another tutorial we covered surfacing using precise curves and generating surfaces by sweeping along these curves. That approach is highly effective for surfacing when you have a precise set of lines from a basis design or designs with subtle and progressive curvature. Alternatively, the loft command, which builds a surface by approximating the shape provided by guiding curves, can be extremely useful for designs with high degrees of novel curvature change, such as the bulbous bow. So, by the end of today's lecture, you should be able to identify essential commands used for rapid hull modeling and create a primitive bulbous bow hull using interpolated curves, control point curves, and the loft command for surface creation. The method I'm using here today, I adapted from Gerard Peterson over at rhinocenter.nl. He has a couple amazing fairing and surfacing tutorials, and if you end up in an organization with a training budget, I highly encourage you to check them out if you want to seriously develop your ship modeling skills. I've thrown a link in the description in case you want to take a look at some of the really creative solutions he is proposing to improve the way naval architects model. So whenever you're going to begin a design, I think it's always good to start with a sketch. And I'm not talking a really advanced sketch with a high level of detail, something that any architect or engineer would be proud of. I'm talking about a cocktail napkin level sketch. Just a quick way to jot down your thoughts and organize how you think the design might look. So you see on the screen, I began by creating a profile view of the vessel that just sort of shows some of the general aspects that I'm imagining creating here. And then I've translated that into a rough three-dimensional form. And I've kind of attempted to project what I think some of the lines may look like if I was to look at it from its third dimension. Now, as I proceed through my CAD design, I have an inclination or an intuition about how the design should be progressing and the curves of form that I should be seeing. And if I'm not seeing those, I need to step back and consider whether I've made an initial mistake in my assumptions or whether I'm not designing according to the needs and requirements of the vessel that I was envisioning building. So now with a rough sketch completed and an idea of what I might think the vessel should look like, I'm going to move into the CAD software and start generating some rapid hull forms. So I'm going to begin by opening Rhino on my desktop and we'll get started. I'm going to create a new project, uh, a large object in meters. I'll begin by maximizing the top screen. I'm going to begin by creating a line that starts at the origin and extends 135 meters in the X direction, basically representing the center line length of my ship. I'm then going to go ahead and create copies of that line in the top and front planes, creating a box that bounds my design. This will provide construction lines that I can use to build my curves off of. Now that I've completed those curves, uh, beginning with a free form interpolated point curve, 
I'm going to go ahead and create the bulbous bow shape that we envisioned in our sketch earlier. So remember that an interpolated curve uh, interpolates the curve quite literally off a number of key points. So make sure you select your points in order to develop the shape. You may have to undo the points several times as you're about to see me do here. And uh, choose your points carefully in order to approximate the shape that you desire. In this case, I'm just going to look for a fairly round bulbous curvature and then extend that curve towards my top line. All right, now that I've created that curve, I'm going to rotate that curve in two planes. I'm going to rotate it uh, within the XZ plane, and then I'm going to make another slight rotation in the YZ plane in order to offset this curve slightly from the main projection of my bulb. And when we go to create our surface later, this is going to help create the three-dimensional sweep of the bulb and really give us that bulbous shape that we're looking for at the bow of the vessel. So you can see I'm just trying to reproduce curves that have a general shape that approximates the projection that I envisioned when I sketched this out. And this kind of underscores the importance of having an idea of the design in your head and not being afraid to take some loose paper and sketch out what you think your idea or your design should look like. That's going to permit you to have an idea much earlier in the design as to whether you're drafting it in such a way that is consistent with what you believed or imagined it to be. Now I'm going to create another interpolated point curve, and I'm going to move just aft of my bow section. I'm just going to select a near point on the baseline, and I'm just looking to create a type of curvature that's going to represent where the bulb flares out along the midside of the vessel. Now you're looking for a bulb or circular shape, but I'm not going to be overly particular here because ultimately you'll see later that we take some steps to ensure that we can correct these based on our curves of form. Uh, so right now we're just trying to rough in our curves. And when I create this curve, I'm going to extend my projection up to the maximum beam construction line that we've created. Uh, again, identifying the principal dimensions and the extents of our curvature. And once again, this just helps us align all our curvature points so that they terminate at the extents or maximum breadth of the vessel. And this will be important when we go to loft our design. Now I'm going to use an interpolated curve to create a floating curve. And the floating curve is a secondary curve that you can see me creating on the screen right now. And that curve defines the transition from the bow section towards the mid body. So you might notice in the way I'm generating the curve, I'm trying to give it some sort of curvature that is a wider version of the bow flare that we saw at the end of the bulb from the secondary bow curve. And you might note the change in the curvature as it flares towards the beam of the ship, and that's going to give it some breadth and allow the ship to transition smoothly towards a full wall-sided midship section. For the mid body, I'm going to use a control point curve. This is a matter of personal preference. You could use an adjustable blend curve or a series of polylines and fit the curve, or you could use the interpolated curve I've already used. I just prefer the control point curve because I find it easier to give myself a wall-sided approximation by using the control points versus trying to select the points that are going to correctly interpolate to the line. But it's simply a matter of personal preference and there's many, many ways to do this. With one midship curve created, I'm going to copy that curve, choose a point to copy it from, and I'm going to make three copies of this curve extending aft through what will be the parallel mid-body of the vessel. Don't get too hung up here making all sorts of curves to define your design. Simple is better in this case. And really, you're probably only looking at between seven and nine curves to define your entire vessel shape. With an increased number of curves, you're going to create an increased difficulty with the lofting process as the program tries to interpret how to loft across so many different surfaces. I'm now going to create a floating stern section curve. It's really not terribly important how it's defined or designed. I'm going to begin at the construction line that defines the top side of my maximum breadth. And I'm going to extend this curve down in some sort of narrowing or fared fashion until it projects over what would be the center line or keel of the vessel. And this is going to help define the transition from a more parallel midbody towards a finer stern section.
with the floating stern curve created, I'm going to copy that curve and I'm going to move that curve aft towards the stern of the ship. I'm then going to move into the right viewport and adjust this curve to provide a narrower and finer transition at the aft end of the ship. Once again, remember that you can adjust these in myriad ways to suit your own personal tastes and preferences. This is simply one way of showing you how it might be done. Depending on the vision you're trying to create and the design that you're imagining, there are all sorts of different curve configurations that may be appropriate for your vessel. All right, with our hull curves complete, we're now ready to loft the curves and create the hull surface. And the loft command generates a surface using the hull curves as guidelines for how to drape the loft or the surface around the curves. Before doing this, at the bottom of the screen, select record history. Using the loft command, I find it easiest to begin with the areas of most gentle curvature and then proceed towards the more complicated curvature. So you can see in this case I'm beginning aft and selecting my curves progressively going forwards till I get to my bow section. There's two reasons for doing this. First reason is that the progressive change in subtle curvature helps Rhino identify how the loft is supposed to proceed. The second reason is that in the event that you are having difficulty lofting, you can loft this shape in sections. Beginning with the subtly curved sections, you can see if the loft is proceeding the way you intended it to. And then you can make adjustments to your individual curves, or you can change the way you're trying to loft the shape in order to get the result you're looking for. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a hull surface layer here and change the surface so it's sitting on that layer. I find that when I'm trying to loft, it's always easiest to try and select my curves in approximately the same quadrant of the curve at all times. I'm sure that there's an underlying rationale behind the surface normals and the way surfaces project in Rhino. I don't know what that is. Uh, I just know that from my experience, this is a method that I found tends to work well. And if your surface ends up really poor, don't accept the surface or delete the surface and simply adjust the way you're selecting your parameters Try some different things, loft it in sections, and with a little bit of patience in how you're lofting the surface, I find you can usually get this to work very effectively. By using the record history function, we've created a mechanism by which we can now select the individual curves and drag them to different locations, which manifests in real time as a translation of the hull surface. This permits us to take a parametric sort of approach to the hull surface design where we can extend the breadth of the ship, extend the length of the ship, change fine curvature by adjusting the control points of our curves without having to reloft the surface over and over and over again. You can see for example here I'm going to select three of my hull curves and use the command points on to turn the control points of those curves on. Now I can drag those curves outwards increasing the breadth of my vessel in that localized region. You can see the overall effect of the surface on that change to the beam. Similarly, I can select the stern curve and adjust the stern curve, creating a finer or more angular stern shape as compared with the previously somewhat subtle transition from the floating stern curve. All right, so now that I'm reasonably happy with the shape of my surface, I'm going to use the mirror command to create the other half of my ship hull. So I'm going to mirror this around the center line plane, and now we can take a complete look at the shape of the surface in the perspective view.
All right, I'm gonna use the line command here to create a line between the two stern endpoints. I'm then gonna use that line and the two stern curves to edge surf or create a surface using those edges that basically defines the transom or sternmost section of the ship. With those two surfaces created, I'm going to use the surface planar curve command and select the uppermost curves of the surface in order to close or cap my surface. All right, I'm gonna use the edge surface command and I'm gonna select the curve that I used for the stern section as well as the planar curves created by the two hull surface halves. And I'm going to create a surface that encapsulates basically the top or deck of my hull form. All right, if we select all of our surfaces, we can join the surfaces together. And you'll see that when I join the surfaces together, it gives me a warning that says I've broken the history. That just means that I've now lost the ability to continue to change the shape of the design using my control curves. Going to the Object Properties tab though, we can see that I've now created a closed poly surface. That's a good sign. That means that the surface is now being treated as one entirely closed poly surface that encapsulates a volume. Subsequently, we can use the hydrostatics command, volume commands, and other commands that are built into Rhino in order to give us some basic property and mass property measurements of our hull forms. You can see I've entered the hydrostatics command. I'm gonna push the W key so I can set my own water line. I'm going to identify the water line at eight meters and run the hydrostatics. And you can see that the hydrostatics command properties come up. I get an idea of the wetted surface area, the total volume of my hull form uh, at that water line, a number of other salient details that can help us forward our design. All right, I'm going to quickly go through how we can use some other shapes to provide some definitions to our hull to give it features that we may want at a later date. So in this case, I'm gonna create a cylinder. So I'm gonna use the cylinder command and I'm gonna ensure its length is sufficient to pierce the section of the ship that I want it to intersect. In this case, you can see I'm putting it in a fairly traditional bow thruster location just aft of the bulbous bow. Now that the cylinder is there, I'm gonna use the Boolean difference command over on the left-hand side of the menu. I'm gonna open the solid menu and when it cascades, I'm gonna select the Boolean difference it's going to prompt me to select my surface that I want to subtract from. In this case, I'm going to select my hull, press enter. Then I'm going to choose my cylinder shape, which is the shape that I want to subtract from my surface. And you can see that it automatically performs the function of intersecting the two shapes. And now I have that nice protrusion through the hull form. All right, so in summary, to form a rapid hull model, create construction lines that block your design. Then rough in your bow curves and build a floating curve that defines the transition between your bow and the midship. Create a series of midship curves that bound the midship section and then generate a floating stern curve and a stern curve that help define your mid body to stern transition and the stern section respectively. When you apply the loft command, you will consistently get the best results when you loft loosely around the curves. And when you select your curves, remember to choose them in the order you'd like the loft to proceed. Try to select the curves along the same quadrant, and don't be afraid to loft in sections to troubleshoot your design. If you're having trouble lofting in a section, the curvature may be too extreme between the basis curves. Today, I introduced the rapid hull modeling method and demonstrated how more complex geometries might be generated using basis curves and the loft command. I encourage you to start walking through the process of trying to create a rapid hull model using data from a parametric analysis to guide your designs. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to leave them in the comments or email me directly. Your feedback helps me make each tutorial better, so if there's something you're not seeing or would like to learn, let me know.